I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm not going to be talking about Nicaragua. I'm just going to be showing this beautiful garden here with beautiful weather on a beautiful windy day here in Leon. But today I'm going to be talking a little bit about YouTube statistics because a lot of you watch my show all the time and some of you are just coming here for YouTube information. But there's some things that seem really obvious when you look at some of the stats and they are not at all obvious uh, when you look at it in the bigger picture. So I'm going to give some background information that I think are going to be kind of useful. Useful. This comes up because we're doing the, uh, or did, the live show on Channel 8 News this week, and some of the stats they were looking for surprised them. So, we're going to talk about that right after the bump. All right, I'm going to have a couple extra content things and some Nicaragua stuff at the end, but most of you are here for YouTube stuff. So when you're looking at YouTube, this came up because I was going to be on Channel 8, or was, uh, a few days ago, and the first thing they asked is, how many subscribers do you have? Because I've been on shows before, so we're, we're like clear, we're going to be on TV, but everyone always wants to know how many subscribers we have, and honestly, at this point, we're just under 7,500. We should have passed 7,400 as I'm making this video. Now, here in Nicaragua, if you're looking at actual individual vlogs, that's where you have a program that's a single contributor, not a company making videos with a production team and lots of different people making them. For example, a real estate company might show a bunch of different houses, just make videos about houses, but they're sending out teams and it's, a te it's, just, it's not a single person production. For a single person production, as far as I know, I'm the largest vlogger in the country by the number of subscribers. But that number is still relatively small. Some of those real estate companies have 15 or even 30,000 subscribers. So, so those are much bigger numbers than 7,500. And some of the government channels have 20 or 30,000 uh, easily. Some I think are pushing 80 or 90,000 um, often when they're tied to a TV station. So 7,500 doesn't sound like a really big number. And if you're used to other YouTube content, 7,500 definitely is not a really big number. It's not bad but it's not a huge number. So it's surprising to a lot of people to be like, oh wait, only 7,500, but don't you have a lot of attention, don't you? So let's talk about one, why that's a pretty good number here. So first of all, I'm in English in Nicaragua and my content is about Nicaragua most of the time. Sometimes it's about relocation or travel or some different things, but often it's, it's Nicaragua focused because that's where I live and that's where people have found a lot of interest. So in this market, this is a really big number because this is a very small local market. The number of people internationally that are looking at it are it is pretty small as well. That pool is not very big. For people making this content, I'm actually the largest, period. Like worldwide, this is the largest for this category. So whatever number I have reflects about as big as that currently is. And we're growing steadily. So that is a market that appears to be growing. And obviously, I'm not the only one. So the number of channels actually, I think, is shrinking. We see fewer people making this content rather than more over time. There's a couple of us that, you know, really stand out and we all know each other here in this market. It's a very small market, believe it or not. Uh, but that's important to understand. So this is a really big number considering the context, but it still sounds low to a lot of people. But when I was talking to the television station and we said, but here's how many views we have for the year, then their eyes opened up. And our views currently for the last year is 1.2 million. Uh, so these numbers don't seem to go together for people. And I think the reason is because it's really visible. When you hop on YouTube and you go to look at any given channel, you're like popping around and you're like, ah, how many people are watching this? And you, the only number that really shows up to you is how many people viewed the video you're on. So that's that tells you how popular a single video is, but you have to combine that with how old it is. Has it been out for an hour? Has it been out for a month? Has it been out for 10 years? Those, you know, those, that number just climbs over time. It never goes down. It's not like an average, it's a, it's a total. So time matters with that. So you kind of have to do this calculation. And it's the only, and that only shows you that video. The only thing you really have to tell you about the channel is a count of how many videos they have, which is not that obvious. They don't pop that on the screen, like in your face, because who really cares? And how many subscribers they have. I'm not really sure why they tell you how many subscribers someone has, because it's not very useful information. If anything, it's super misleading. But so when you come to my channel, the thing that pops up is 7.5 thousand subscribers. And what does that tell you? Really nothing. What it t technically tells you is seven and a half thousand people or bots 
have signed up to receive notifications of some sort about my channel. It could be that they want to be notified when something drops. It could be that they want to know when a live stream comes up. It could be as simple as they want uh, my content to show up in their home screen and they want to make sure that it definitely shows up, not just using the algorithm. But this, in this day and age, loads of people don't bother with subscribing to things. If you do want to, please do subscribe to this. It does help in some way. So, so don't skip it if, if you can. Uh, and definitely like the video. Again, those things don't do very much. They, I do appreciate them and they make me feel good when those numbers go up, but it's not actually doing anything. The thing that really does something is watching the video, watching all of the video, engaging with the video, commenting and such, and then very importantly, clicking another video after mine, preferably another one of mine, but even if it's someone else's, that's still good because it's telling YouTube that my show has encouraged you to stay on the platform. And if you can go to another one of my shows and another one, then it shows YouTube that the more they show my show, the more you're going to be stuck on the platform. So those things are really important to me and to YouTube and the algorithm. But uh, when you're when you're looking at just those people who have subscribed, it is just, who cares? Because so many people find my content and they may like it, they may watch it. And if you watch my content, especially if you engage with it in a positive way, like leaving comments or asking questions, then YouTube is going to say, okay, when, when Scott makes another video that's similar to this, we're going to show it to this person as well. And so if you watch my videos every day, it doesn't matter if you subscribe. And you can test this by, and please do, go make a generic account or log into a computer where you have no account on YouTube whatsoever. It doesn't know who you are. And watch a couple of my shows. And after doing that, couple, three, four times, you're going to start seeing that YouTube is going to show you my show one after another after another. It will show you other people. It will try things out and be like, maybe you'll like this thing. Maybe you'll like that thing. Probably somehow related to my content, but it'll definitely keep showing you at least some number of options of my show. So you don't have to be subscribed to suddenly have the algorithm determine that my show is the thing to show you. So you could really like my show. You could be completely engaged. You could be one of my financial backers, but if you don't subscribe, that doesn't matter. YouTube's going to keep putting it on your homepage day after day. Even if you haven't signed in, it will remember who you are based on your IP address, your cookies, and that kind of stuff, and it'll keep showing you my show. So there's a large number of people who may be engaging with my content because it's me and they just randomly click on me, but they don't want to make an effort to specifically subscribe. It could be that they're into my show because it's the content and they don't watch every show, but they watch every time that I talk about importing vehicles or every time I talk about walking in barrios, right? Those topics may be things that they want. So YouTube may not show them my show generically every time I make an episode, but when I make one in the realm of what they like to watch, it will show them theirs. And again, that's a spot where subscribing wouldn't have helped them necessarily, but YouTube showing them what the algorithm thinks they're going to like could be perfect. So I could have a large number of pseudo subscribers who are part of the channel, but have never made an effort to actually, you know, discreetly say, I want to be subscribed to this channel. And, and that, uh, I like when people subscribe. I like when I subscribe to channels because it's like, I don't want to lose this. What if they don't make a video for a long time? What if their content changes? Well, I don't care. I like Scott and this beard and this rambling hat wearing guy. And he could talk about things that aren't Nicaragua. Maybe he moves to Panama and talks about that. I'd still be interested just because, you know, it's, it's, it's a vibe I like, right? So for those people, uh, that's what subscriptions are for. I subscribe to Camera Conspiracies, for example, because I like his vibe. I don't care if he's talking about lenses or cameras. I don't care if he goes off about Canon, which I don't use, or if he's talking about Fuji, which I do use, right? It doesn't matter. I like watching the show. It's the vibe that I want. So I specifically want to be subscribed so that YouTube doesn't get confused and think it's something that I, I, about his content that I like rather than the form of his, of his content, if that makes sense. So for those of you who want to see me and you don't care so much about what I'm talking about, subscribing is the tool for you. But if it's the content and not all the content that matters for you, then it's the algorithm will probably do a better job of choosing for you. Now, I ask you to please subscribe anyway, even if that's not what you want. And if you need to ignore some of those videos, well, OK, but even better, just let it play in the background. And that does an amazing amount for promoting the show. Just getting on there and clicking, yes, I do want to watch these and letting it run at least most of the way through the video. And if at all possible, watching another one at the end or near the end. Those are the things that really help so much. Of course, buying me a coffee helps the most. But second to that, this is what really does it. This promotes the show. This, this really tells YouTube what that is. So when we're looking at these numbers, the things that YouTube actually cares about is primarily 
watch time, which is something that's not available to you in any way. If you use a tool like vidIQ, and normal people would not, this is for YouTubers, but it's free and you could go access it. If you went and got vidIQ or a tool like that and connected it to my channel, which you can do for up to three uh, alternative channels that you don't own so you can have some competitor information, there's a lot of things it won't tell you, but it will tell you how many subscribers I have and when I got them. It'll also tell you how many views my channel has and when I got those. And that will give you some amount of information about my channel. It would tell you that I have 1.2 million views for the year and about 7,500 subscribers. And from that, you would have to use your own kind of interpolation of watching my show and thinking critically about what might be driving those things to get an idea of what those, those numbers mean. When you actually own a channel, then you have additional information, which hopefully is obvious. And that information includes things like how much people engage and leave comments, how much people uh, stay on your channel, how long they watch each episode. Uh, do they click onto another one of your episodes? Do they click away? Do they like all these different engagement numbers? And, and one of the most important ones is how long they're actually watching. And that's combined with the views are some of the amazing things that uh, you guys don't really see. And that's the number of hours that we're getting um, of views every four weeks. So YouTube really does everything by a lunar month. That's the 13 of them in a year, 28 days. Uh, so that's exactly four weeks. Um, so when we talk about lunar numbers, that's what we're talking about. And with that, we're hitting somewhere between like 80 and 120,000 views during that time. Views, again, could be shorts. It could be someone who watches the video for one minute and then clicks away. So they're meaningful, but they're not super meaningful. The amount of time that someone stays on an episode, though, that's super meaningful. So even if I had 100 people who watched for 100 minutes per episode, that'd be far better than if I had 1,000 people watch for two minutes, right? Not that 1,000 people would be bad, but the longer duration would almost certainly be better. Of course, YouTube takes a lot of things into consideration, including the topic, the time time of day, the uh, demographics of the audience, the locations of the audience, all kinds of things when they're determining how good a video is and also monetization. Both of those things have a lot of complexity behind them, which I'm not going to dig into on this particular episode. You guys aren't that interested in that, I don't think. If you are, of course, get in those comments and let me know. And I'm happy to talk about what whatever, although I do have a new vlog channel that I need to get to that I'm going to talk about a lot of those things much more in depth on, not this channel. This is, this is my actual vlog, right? This is my daily life. So I try to keep it pretty light. But because I have so many viewers and because you guys see this information or don't see some of this information, I think it's really interesting, especially when you find out I've been on TV multiple times and, you know, I'm recognized as the top vlogger in the country at this point in any language, right? For a long time, we're like, ah, we're like number two in English. Well, now we're number one, period, like full stop, we're as big as it gets. And the two numbers that make it that our views put us up there with the biggest commercial channels being made by commercial television station above a million views a year. And our watch time, this is actually just crazy, is every 28 days, every lunar month, we are between six and 7,000 hours of viewer time. That is one of you sitting there with your eyeballs looking at this screen for almost 7,000 thousand hours. Okay, this month we're just in the low 6,000s, but those numbers are big, really, really big. And that's where uh, YouTube knows how big the channel is. And we know when we're looking at uh, some of our biggest competitor channels. Now, the big ones are not individual vlogs like, like this. They are commercial channels being made by a company uh, and they're pumping out content from a team of people. And, you know, they've got all kinds of production going on. Nothing like this. No, no people talking, no engaged personalities, nothing like that. And with, with those, they're the ones that are closest to us in total volume. And we know that their views on some of those can be between 75 and 80 percent of what ours are and their um we'll talk about their subscriptions in a second but their uh views being that high you're like okay so they're really close to us in views but we know that the absolute maximum length of their of their episodes are in the minutes whereas these are normally 20 to 60 minutes uh most days it's very rare for us to be under 20 minutes and we've gotten really good feedback from people that longer is better some people are like why is it so long it should be shorter but if we make it shorter both our view time and our views drop off dramatically so our audience as unique as you guys are prefer fast talking rambling long format shows and i can't really change that even though some of you would prefer something else so i'm not trying to ignore those of you who want something else it's that if i try to make you guys happy everyone else is like actually that's not what i'm here for and they don't you don't necessarily know 
that that's what you're here for, but it's what you engage with. It's what is drawing you in. And I've had a lot of people actually sit down and say, oh no, we like it long and here's why. And I have a lot of viewers who like to have it on in the background, a lot of viewers who uh, like have it over breakfast or coffee or something, and they don't want to sit down and be like, oh, I only got five minutes. I was planning on like lingering over a couple coffees and, you know, doing whatever. Maybe they play a word game in the background. I don't know. But there's this getting to enjoy it. And I know at least a few people have mentioned that they're truck drivers and they save the show and they put it on while they're in the truck driving. And because it's a long format, they know they're able to listen to me ramble on for a while. And the, the soothing sound of my radio-like voice works great for them when they're driving, that it keeps them just enough engaged to be able to drive. Uh, it keeps them from getting you know overly excited, which can make you tired when you're driving. And it's not quite so sleepy as to knock them out. I'm so, a little bit surprised by that last part. Okay, so when we're looking at those, um, those numbers for our competitors, right, at 75 or 80% of our views, you say, well, that's pretty good. They're really close. They're nipping at your heels. So first thing, they were bigger than us. They've been that way for a long time. We caught up and blew past them all in the last year. So that their 80% of us is not they're catching up. That's how fast they're falling off. A full year ago, they were still the bigger channel. So our lead, uh, if you think of it that way, if we think of ourselves as competitors, which is not really fair, but if we were thinking of ourselves in that way, we've pulled ahead. It's like you're in a race and for a long time, like a hundred laps, they were ahead of us by a lot. And slowly, slowly, slowly we caught up and now we're 20, 30% ahead of them and accelerating away. Not, not accelerating super fast away, but accelerating away. But their, their per view time must be under three minutes because their longest video is about three, three and a half minutes. So that means that because we know our averages are way over that, right? The average view length is way over their maximum potential view length. And chances are their view, you know, everyone's views are way under 50%. It's way under typically like 20, 30%. So they're probably looking at a total number of view hours in the hundreds if they're lucky. They could be around 100 hours, whereas we're in the six to 7,000 hours. That's where only YouTube actually knows those numbers, but that's where we have a, an insight into what their maximum could be in theory. And they are so far, the gap between us and other shows is so dramatic in that way. Uh, that's what's really getting the attention. That's why people are noticing and that's why you guys are engaging so much. And if you look at the engagement on other, other channels, it's just not the same. So that's, that's some really interesting stuff. And the other thing about subscribers, we're very proud of this because subscribers has been the thing because of the long format, because it's my rambling daily life and it's not a super well-defined channel. That makes it very difficult to actually attract subscribers in a normal sense. Uh, we have just unique challenges and we do everything the opposite here of what uh, YouTube specialists recommend for a channel. They like, keep it short, be really focused, like do all these things, keep it super snappy, don't ramble, always edit, like all these things. We do the opposite of all of that for a lot of reasons. One is this is what is comfortable and fun for me to make. But two, by doing something outside of the norm, but still trying to do a really good job with it, we're producing content that people are missing from the mainstream because everyone's being told not to make this. So like anything, you know, if you, you know, if everybody wants coffee, you say, well, everyone wants coffee, but there's a hundred coffee shops. I'm going to make the one tea room or the one fruit stand. And then even if you're only getting a tiny percentage of the market, you may get a larger percentage of the market than any one of the copycat coffee places does, even though people prefer coffee. But because you're doing watermelon smoothies and you're the only one, then that tiny segment of the population is potentially enough for you to have the largest market share. And that's kind of where we're falling in this case, I believe, is that we're just being enough different that that alone is setting us apart in a lot of interesting ways. Now, when it comes to the subscribers, though, like I was saying, it's very hard because of that to gain new subscribers for this channel. But traditionally, because I've been watching this for years, uh, our main competitor channels, those that are in our general space, our general location could be considered to compete with us, but are not vlogs, right? The, they're, at this point, there were a number of upstart vlogs that came and went, and there's only really in English, at least, two of us left in the market uh, of note at all. Everyone else has dropped off the market. Jack Pittman had a really important channel, uh, and he literally did a video saying he wasn't going to do videos anymore. Then he had a lot of people worry that something had happened to him, so he did come back a few, several months later and make a video about really driving home why he wasn't making videos anymore. Um, and I do think it's a good view. He does have a really important channel or did. It's going to be, you know, there for posterity. 
Um, so he was one of the key players in the vlogging market here, and he disappeared. Uh, Elton with Immense Coffee is still very active. He is uh, now the other main vlogger for the country. So and and we talk to each other, right? And uh, so we're we're definitely hoping to do some collaborations and get together. And if you're not following his channel, why not go follow his channel as well? Absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, but it, it, but a very different format, right? And he's got a, a very different like what he's doing with his channel. Uh, super interesting stuff. So uh, so definitely definitely should be following him. But besides us, it's all like companies and, and salespeople, you know, people selling a product, selling real estate, or, uh, or it's a government channel, right? Like a, like a television station where they have big production and, and they could be really interesting and you should probably follow some of those too, because it's like how you get like regular news and those kinds of things are those channels. They're very different things. But when we're looking at not, you know, giant company like media, uh, like television stations, but when we're looking at anybody in any way that falls into the YouTuber or YouTuber-ish type status, a year ago, two years ago, they were getting uh, subscribers at a very high pace. They weren't getting the views from them, but they would get subscribers. Uh, and that's another important thing about those subscribers. Just because someone subscribes doesn't mean they're actually going to watch your videos. It might mean that they intend to, but it doesn't mean that they actually do. So that number, again, can be really deceiving when you're looking at it in that way. It can reflect simply that your channel's been around for a long time and has accumulated a lot of people clicking the button, and eventually they just stop watching because they lose interest. And that number may mean literally nothing. And you could make a new channel that has zero subscribers and get a million views the next day just because you have really good content that YouTube is like, oh no, people want to see this, and it promotes it. So, so you really do have to take it with a grain of salt. But importantly, because we've watched this organic change, we've watched all the other channels that we carefully watch, and, except for Elton, his is doing really, really great. Um, but they had really good long-term subscriber bases, and they're still growing, but the rate at which they're growing is maybe 10 to 20% what it was in the past. And so it used to be that they were still, even when we were a new channel, they were getting new people much faster than us, even though their views weren't really growing that much because we watch all this just because it's how you know if you're doing a good job. And now we're seeing that the number of new subscribers that we're pulling on this channel is two or three times the rate that the bigger, older channels uh, are adding new subscribers. So even from a subscriber, new subscriber acquisition rate we're showing that this channel is doing exceptionally well compared to the market, not compared to the universal absolute numbers of what's good for YouTube. We're still a tiny channel doing little things. I just wanted to go through some of that stuff because we were on TV this week and it's a whole bunch of things that if you don't do YouTube as a content creator, you will have no idea that that's what these numbers represent and what matters and why it matters. And, and you know, it's so easy to look at subscribers and be like, this must be the thing. YouTube's putting it in my face. I have no idea why YouTube shows that to you. It doesn't mean anything useful. It certainly doesn't tell you anything other than if you're looking for a celebrity and you find someone's channel, you're like, they don't have any subscribers. That's gotta be a copycat. You have 10 million, yeah, it's probably really them. It's useful for that kind of stuff. But outside of that, it really isn't at all. It doesn't tell you what you think it's telling you. So. All right, that's my YouTube stuff. So if you're here just for that, hit a like, leave comments below, do all of that stuff. We're gonna go on to some uh, personal and Nicaragua content uh, for those of you who are sticking around. And while we're waiting to switch over there, of course, if you'd like to support the work we're doing, buy me a coffee link and all that is down below. That comes directly to me. It's, it's uh, buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And I keep asking this and no one's doing it. I really wish you guys would make some videos at home and send in questions. Not to, I love when you guys ask questions, writing in down below, love it. But if you could make some videos and send them in of you asking those questions so we can add our viewers into the show, that would be amazing. I really love it when you guys do that and we get great feedback uh, from all of you guys about how much fun it is when people do that because you get to really get to know each other and connect in a different way. All right, thanks for hanging out, everybody. We're just having a nice, relaxing day here in the garden. I do want to talk a little bit, though. We had a post just recently, and this is surprising that of all the posts we do, it's, it's sometimes it really catches me off guard as to which ones catch a lot of ire from the internet. And surprisingly, the two that really got a lot of attention recently, one is the video where we just simply broke down what it means in law S1881. And that one, the feedback was mostly not too bad. Uh, the one that was really surprising, I'm gonna follow up on a little bit, is the problems with the customer service at the cafeteria at the hospital. And this is a one-time event, but I made a short about it where I talked about that I waited three hours and no one ever tried to sell me a coffee or anything. When I tried to pay the bill, they didn't have a record of me being there. Like I was the only person in the restaurant, five servers, no one ever checked in to find out why we didn't get our food. And I got a lot of really nasty comments on this. Now, it also got a lot of views. So you expect when you have a really popular video, you're going to get a lot of nasty comments. And some of them are just incredibly rude, and that's fine. But 
a lot of them contained a lot of really subtle uh, points that I want to point out to my regular audience because this is something to look for when you see comments being made. Now this is important because there is a there is a really strong and and my regular viewers know that there is a lot of people who are either uh, motivated personally or are pushed by organizations abroad to come in and attempt to make Nicaragua look bad. In this particular case, I was simply mostly being funny. It was a real customer service incident, but mostly being funny in the fact that it was so ridiculously bad. It's not like I was upset the world wasn't ending and I could have grabbed a server and been like, "Why aren't you serving me?" But there. Was was no reason to and I explained this a bit I was there I was stuck waiting in this location we had gone in we had ordered breakfast I'd gotten coffee and never did they bring breakfast we became the only customers there at some point I was the only person left there in this cafeteria with five servers and no one ever checked in to see why our food hadn't been brought no one ever checked in to see why I was still there no one ever checked in whatsoever they never came back to the table I made eye contact I looked at them I made sure that they knew I was there but I didn't get up and stop anyone and yes to some degree this is because I am on the spectrum and engaging with people when they've messed up on their job or forgotten me is not something that I find comfortable making a video about it is something that I do find comfortable Comfortable. So there is a certain amount of this is not an interaction that I want to voluntarily have But also there was a lot of I had to wait and the original food that we had ordered was no longer viable by the time They had messed uh, up the order for so long We didn't want the food to come during a certain window and then when people returned they ended up having to leave There was just a lot of they didn't bring the food promptly and it put us in a position of the food couldn't be eaten While we were there, so I didn't want to at any point it made no sense. I know people wanted to find ways to be rude in the comments, but there was never a time where it made sense for me to bother them about the food, because had I done it in the first small window, it would have been too soon. It would have been rude for me to bother them that quickly. Then, when uh, the people I was with went to the medical appointment, we didn't want to bother them then, or the food would have come while they weren't there. Then when they got back, they weren't able, because it just there wasn't good internet service, they couldn't tell me they were coming, so the window that they had was too small to have the food ordered during that window, and so by the time all this happened, it ended up we had to cancel the order of the food, rather than wait any more for it. So while people were really adamant about, hey, why didn't you say something, because I'm not an idiot, right? That would have been foolish to say something because we couldn't eat the food, but I had to stay and pay, and it didn't make any sense to pay until we left, and I was hoping that they would bring me more coffee, so I was there waiting. That I was going to be there waiting wasn't going to change based on me pushing for food, but it was going to mean that we were going to have to pay for food that was going to get cold and people weren't going to eat. It would mean that I'd have to interact in this negative way that I don't want to, and it means I'd have to push them to bring food for people who weren't there anymore, but were coming, but I didn't know when. So I had to wait, and it made sense in this case that once they had gone too far, we didn't have time to have them bring the food, and they thought they were coming right back, so at first they were like, I've gone all this in an earlier episode. It made sense to sit there and wait, and this was an opportunity to see just how much they would ignore me. Now, I talked about this a bit before, I'm going to touch on it again. Here in Nicaragua, there is a culture of they don't bother you at a table, meaning they don't come and check in on you for anything. They, do, they wait for you to grab someone if you want something further, so that they didn't follow up with me about having a coffee. That was just a missed opportunity on their side. It's not like, oh my gosh, it's such terrible customer service, I can't believe they didn't do that. That they didn't bring me my food and didn't look and say, wow, there's a person who got no food and is just sitting there. We should really uh, remember that we took one order and didn't deliver it, should have occurred to someone. One. That's a customer service fail that I was there for so long and they never checked in. They never looked at their orders. They never just stopped and thought, wow, what's going wrong? That's a customer service fail that they didn't check in and say, don't you want another coffee? No, that's not. I would have liked that, but but that is a clear opportunity. There are so many businesses in Nicaragua that miss that opportunity. I think that that is something worth learning from from North American culture that as a restaurant, you can up your profitability or approach profitability much better if you uh, increase the chances of people consuming things more rapidly. So often in Nicaragua, there are these delays. Well, I have to flag someone down. I have to talk to them into getting me a coffee rather than them being like, hey, can I get you another coffee as soon as you're getting low on one? Like, oh yeah, no. And then you could time it and be like, oh, I have one as soon as my other one's done. Perfect. You're more likely to drink one extra coffee when doing that. And that's where the profits are. Same thing with beer at night, for example, or dessert. 
So there's an opportunity there that is just being missed because this is how restaurants operate. But it's difficult to make that change because waiters are not expecting to do it and customers are not used to it. So you, you have a little bit of a cultural thing on both sides that can make it a little bit difficult. But you still want to have your food brought, but it made absolute logical sense. All the things that people are like, why didn't you just get up and say something? What kind of entitled person are you? because that would have been incredibly stupid to just make a point of, hey, you didn't bring me my food and now I want it to sit on the table and get cold to make a point. Why would I do that? But if you read these comments really carefully, the majority of them don't just say rude things about me, that I don't care about so much, but a lot of them use that as a cover for making really inappropriate remarks about Nicaragua or people in Latin America or more general. Watch for these because it's important. And what you'll see is people saying uh, things like you, you're bringing in a North American attitude to Nicaragua. And that sounds like, oh, you're being all American, which is a bad thing to do here, right? Or anywhere to come and be like, why isn't this America? But they're implying that Nicaraguans don't do their job. They're implying that getting good customer service is not something I have a right to expect in Nicaragua. And of course, Nicaraguans would argue that's insane. Nicaraguans want good customer service the same as anyone else. And good restaurants in Nicaragua have good customer service like anywhere else. Maybe it's slightly different, of course. There are cultural differences, but good customer service is not something that we don't have or don't want. It's that this was a specific incident where somebody screwed up, well, five people screwed up in a cafeteria. And the fact that we were in Nicaragua is not the major point. It is a point that this one cultural behavior of being less likely to come follow up with a table opens yourself up for these pe for someone to have sat there for a really long time, waiting patiently and never getting their food. And for the first long time, it's maybe they're busy. Maybe they're, who knows, right? Who wants to push a place after 25 minutes and be like, it's been 25 minutes. That's not a reasonable amount of time to complain about not getting food. Maybe they, everyone was on break. Maybe someone was sick and in the bathroom. That would be bad if it's in the kitchen, but you know, you don't know, right? You don't want to bother people. And then by the time it was to a point where you want to bother someone, it was too late and there was nothing to do. So then it becomes just a funny situation. Uh, if I was in a panic to get food, of course I could have. But so watch for these comments where they're using it as an opportunity to try to make other places sound good or to make Nicaragua sound bad. Oh, you can't expect Nicaraguans to have good customer service, you know, and they, they, they give some really offensive reason why you can't expect that. And then they use the cover of trying to make me sound like the bad guy in order to make these inappropriate comments. And this is the same thing that we see with leading questions and leading comments um, all the time, that you, you do one thing to distract people and then you just slide into the reasons behind things, the offensive thing that you're trying to say, or the incorrect thing or the misleading thing that you're trying to say. So I got a lot of these on this particular uh, post. Now, again, there was like 10,000 people watched it in a day. So of course it's going to get a lot of negative attention. A lot of people who aren't members of the channel watched it, but it's amazing how many people just watch this little information about customer service. They, it was enough that YouTube said, this is something you'd be interested in. They watched it, they engaged with it, and they took the time to make offensive comments about something that wasn't actually in the video that there's so much effort putting into being offensive to a culture just never ends uh, surprising me. Like it never stops surprising me how much dislike people have for people from other parts of the world just, just because they're from different parts of the world. That really is a strong thing that remains in the world. And watch out for that. Watch for that in the comments. That is, that is something that you're always gonna, when you're looking to move abroad, anything, and I had one of these comments uh, separate from this one. And I can't remember which video it was on, but someone, uh, Jorge, someone left this really long rant and it was well written, like from a grammatic standpoint. So someone put a little bit of effort into this. It certainly didn't look like AI or anything like that, but made some really strong comments about the entire world of immigrants. Any person who goes to a new country, uh, he basically made this statement that it was a horrific thing that countries allowed people to leave their borders. And it was a bizarre rant. And of course it made no sense and it got a lot of pushback, but that people take the time to write this stuff is really out there. And whether they believe it or not, people put a lot of effort into writing things like the idea of moving to a new country is abhorrent. All people should be stuck in the country that they're in. You should always suffer uh, under the government you currently have. You should always uh, live in the culture that you were born in. Like, like the whole idea of that people should be separate and not have the, the right to 
Russian move, which is interesting because he pretended at least to be writing from America, a country made completely of immigrants. Okay, I understand there's some Native Americans, but they're a tiny percentage of the population. The United States is a country of immigrants. He basically said the United States doesn't have a right to exist while attempting to write a thing about how no one should have the right to leave America. Completely incongruous, but that's what happens when you Let's face it, people start to get a little bit disliking of other cultures, you're going to get nonsensical because logically, people are all nice from all over the world. All people are good, all places, no matter how nice those people are, because everywhere is nice, has bad people. No one gets away from it, right? There's no excuse, there's no like, oh, well, this group of people, they have no bad people there. No, everyone does, right? But one of the things you learn from traveling, one of the things you learn from living abroad, um, less from living abroad, typically when you live abroad, you only get to experience a couple different places. So if you simply move from the United States to Nicaragua, you may easily get the impression that Nicaragua has, and I'm gonna say this in the most generic way possible, good food and nice people. Because no matter what you do when traveling, people show up in a new country and say, wow, how did you like that country? Oh, you know what? They had good food and nice people. I want to go there more, right? And what you finally, after you travel enough, realize is that the world is pretty much made up of good food and nice people. If you're going to have a country that has not nice people, that is the exception, not the rule. And very unlikely for you to encounter that. You may encounter not nice people, but as a group, as a culture, not very likely at all. And if you're going to encounter a place that doesn't have good food, that's super surprising. It may not be a food that you are used to, and that may make you less enamored of it. But let's face it, all over the world, people came from the same stock and background. And one thing we all share is a need to nourish ourselves to keep going for the next day. And so we all like to eat, and we've all put effort into having good food. And while Yes, there's some differences between Chinese cuisine and Italian cuisine. Fundamentally, they like tasty noodle things. So yeah, the world isn't that different from one place to another, even though the accents change a bit and sometimes the weather is a bit different. But these are things that if you travel, it, it starts to become really apparent that the world is more different in its flavors and spices and music and weather and less in people being nice or having good food. And so it's an important aspect of traveling to start to realize that we're kind of all in this together. And while, you know, governments try to make us at odds and, and separate us from one another, we're not at a fundamental level. Humanity is, is, you know, we're on one big team trying to survive in a world that's, uh, that's struggling, right? And, uh, and so you see that in the comments and it's, I think it's important to have those views when you come into the comments and be aware that there are a lot of people motivated to try to use any form that they can to try to hurt places that they don't like. And they're going to do that and watch for it. It's especially prevalent in these kind of backhanded or leading or kind of hidden remarks because they, it gets in your brain and that's all they want to do. They're, these are the people who are putting effort into it. Not the people who are just ranting about a place they don't like. Oh, I hate X country because I don't know just a reason, right? I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. That, yeah, you get some angry people. They're not effective. No one listens to them. And normally they get blocked by something. But when you're talking about people who are making a, a rational, logical, well-written time consideration paragraph and they're writing it down, they're probably in many cases, I mean, obviously some people are making good comments, but when people are making bad ones, these are the people who are actively attempting to harm a place by building this trend of emotional responses. And if enough people say things like, oh, you can't expect this country to do a good job because the people aren't up to par with this other country, you hear that enough and it starts to be something that even if you would never say it out loud, it starts to be in your brain, right? And it's, you, you know you hear this, right? And you'll hear it about Nicaragua. Nicaraguans say this about themselves, so you have to be really careful. But they'll say Nika time, right? Uh, meaning things happen slowly. But generally, Nicaraguans do things faster than a lot of other places. And I'm not saying that other places are slow. That's not a good way to look at it. Everybody does things on their own pace. And I've said this a lot. The United States is big on scheduling. They're, they do things on a very strict schedule. We get this from our German background, right? German in, Germans, which I'm German, right? We love our schedules. We love having precise times for things. And we're willing to wait longer to know exactly when it's going to happen. And trust me, 
I get that internal feeling like, my gosh, I don't know when things are going to happen. I don't like this, but if I know when it's going to happen, I don't care how long I have to wait because I have a predictable time for it. Nicaraguans have a different cultural aspect to many things. Obviously, everything's different, but there's so much more. We just go as fast as we can, and that can give a perception of being slow when it's actually faster. And a great example is if you were in Germany or in the United States and you want to take a bus, that bus is going to take off and arrive at a very precise time. It's what we do culturally. I'm not saying there's no exceptions, but you know what I mean? It's it's a very it's a timetable based thing. Here in Nicaragua, you say, okay, what time does the UCA bus run to Managua? You're like, you th there's not a schedule. The bus pulls up, they load, they go, right? Well, when's the next one go? As fast as it can pull forward, load and go. Right? They're not waiting to go to a precise time. They're not going when they're partially empty. They're waiting to fill up, but generally that's as fast as you can possibly push people onto the bus. Right? Everybody just runs in. I'm not saying there's a huge line. It's not like that, but quite often it's, you know, a few people waiting, the bus pulls up and it's mostly full as fast as people can comfortably board. It's not like a mad rush and people wait in line. So it's not like, <laughs> it's not like you have to like do something crazy to be able to get on. It's not hard, but they then go as fast as they can. Oh, we're full. I guess we go, right? They're not like, oh, we're not due to depart for five minutes. So we're going to wait in case one of you decided to get off, get something and get back. They're not going to do that, right? They just go. So it's a completely different cultural way of looking at the world. And you can argue which one you like more or less, but you'll hear a lot of people say things with Nika time. And some people did make this comment, at least he didn't say Nika time, about uh, the, the cafeteria that didn't bring my food. And it's really important though. The cafeteria didn't bring my food. The five servers never put in an effort to check what had happened to my food. And no point was anyone slow. Right, you can look at it as slow. How long did it take to get your food? Indefinitely, so long that I haven't gotten it yet. Wow, but that's Nika time, right? But that's obviously not what happened. No one was slow, no one was lazy. Well, you can argue maybe someone was lazy. That doesn't make any sense either because it took no effort to check in and be like, hey, did you get your food? It's that they don't culturally do that and they were just not paying attention to me, even though I was the only one there. Right, they needed to pay some attention, but they were doing lots of other things. They weren't, they weren't sitting around being lazy. They were cleaning, they were putting things away. They were doing stuff. Right, and consistently living in Nicaragua, we see that, right? People really do generally have a pretty good work ethic. Nowhere has a perfect work ethic, nowhere. But we get a lot of stuff done here and in good time. We're always commenting how fast things get done. So the idea that, you know, people start bringing up Nika time. Now I realize when some people are like, thank goodness he didn't say Nika time, they're probably being it in a positive way. That would have been bad and it would have been because that's absolutely not true in general or in this case. But you do hear people casually say it all the time. And over time, you will start, you'll hear, especially expats, but Nicaraguans say it too. They'll be like, oh, it's Nicaragua, it takes so long to get things done. Really? Have you gone other places and timed it? I don't think it does. I'm not saying that nothing is ever slow. Sometimes the road is slow, but that's not Nika time, that's, that's traffic, right? Nika time is actually faster than most of the world. At least in my experience, it's at least not slow. Uh, but because people repeat it so much, it gets into your head and you actually start to get a feeling that Nicaraguans do things slow and that things are on Nika time and it doesn't even really exist. It's just something that people repeat and because they repeat it, they assume it must be true for everyone else. It must be the way it is. And that's what people are doing. There's this repetition to create a mindset problem and watch for it in the comments. It really is happening. And whether it's AI or government controlled or just people who, who want to denigrate the country and are putting in that effort, it's there. So watch out for it. Uh, but don't be a part of it. Go in there, fight for clear information. Take it that, yeah, sometimes we got to report when a bad, bad thing has happened. Customer service was bad today and it was funny. Like sometimes that's all it is, but we can't get to a point where we can never talk about customer service. We can never talk about cultural differences because we're all so sensitive that, oh my gosh, you can never mention how things are different, right? How else can we adapt to each other? How else can we appreciate each other? It's our differences that make us strong, but only if we know those differences. When you work in business and you work in different cultures, you have to know how different cultures react, how they uh, perceive things, how they, how they work, right? I work in many different countries. I have teams in many different countries and we each region, we have to know cultural differences and we have to talk about it. We have to train uh, South Americans on how Americans perceive things that they do because in there it's happening in the opposite. Instead of Americans visiting South America, it's South Americans visiting the United States. And there's a lot of things that they think in, in South America are polite and they're trying to be polite when they come to the U.S. And Americans don't find that as polite. They find it as, as, as the opposite. And, there, and it takes a lot of explanation. Here's why Americans feel this way. Oh, that is so different than how we perceive it. 
Exactly. That's why you have to appreciate those things. And when I go to South America, I have to do the opposite. I have to remember to do those things because not doing them is perceived as impolite. But I'm trying to be polite, but it's my culture. We have a difference in how we react in that way or how we interact in that way. So those are things. It's important for us to know you have to understand the differences to be able to appreciate the differences, to be able to interact in a meaningful way. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you, or don't like and subscribe. Just watch more videos, right? We all know. But the like and subscribe is nice. It makes me feel good. If nothing else, if you'd like to support the channel, as I said earlier, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, if you could post on social media, tell someone you know about the show, invite them to come in and join our little party here on our daily everything talk about show of all kinds of wild and crazy things. That would be much appreciated. I will see all of you tomorrow. And if you haven't seen this before, we're going to put up four videos at the end of uh, the show here. If you could just click on one of those, like I was talking about, clicking on another episode tells the algorithm that this is something that leads you to more YouTube. So if you could just click on one of those, let it play in the background, it would be much appreciated.